Good morning. I had an epiphany the other day. I had them on a regular basis. And uh, I've been trying to write a book. And uh, I discovered something that I should have known a long time ago. Back when I was in Long Beach, I got the idea to write a book. I'm not sure why, but uh, I thought, well, I'll write a book on Buddhism. And I never could get started. And uh, I thought, well, and people would say, ever thought about writing a book? And I'd go, well, yeah, but there's so many books out there that uh, there's really no point. And that's, that's the way I felt. And here, a year or two ago, a good friend of mine has Temple in Ontario. He said to me one day, we we're having lunch. He said, you ought to write a book. And I thought, oh, okay. Why? You know, because <clears throat> it seems to me there's lots of books out there. I, I read lots of books. I, I like uh, whodunits. Uh, I don't care for Agatha Christie short stories, but I like her long stories. I love Sherlock Holmes. I've memorized most of his stories. And I read history. And I'm thinking of going back to school, maybe in the winter, uh, because I could probably make it from the parking lot to the building at our local college without collapsing. I can't do it in this heat. So I said, why? And he said, well, <clears throat> you have a different way of looking at things. And of course, he hit the nail right on the head. I do have a different way. We all have a different way. Uh, I'm, I'm reminded one time years ago, I was trying to learn how to train monks. And I made a few mistakes. I still make mistakes. Uh, probably because I can't read minds and foretell the future. I make mistakes. And uh, so I said to them, I thought, well, how do I, how do I get them? And they, they, none of them lived here. They all lived in Los Angeles or thereabouts. <clears throat> and they had followed me out to the desert because uh, at my teacher's temple, I led these meditation retreats three or four times a year. So we didn't see very much of each other, but they came out and said, eh, they wanted to be monks. And, you know, they, they'd seen the other centers in America, the Japanese and, and the Korean. And they decided that they, they liked the idea of wearing a robe and being a monk. So I, I always go back to the way my teacher trained me. And uh, he did things, and, and these monks, they've heard about it over and over again. Uh, the first time I gave a talk, I've got a yellow robe on. And he never, uh, full men has the unique distinction of giving a talk while he was still a novice. Because Tianan never had novices give talks. They always waited until they had a yellow robe, they were fully ordained. Which means if they, let's say they ordained a couple months before, that means they knew absolutely nothing. Because that's really the beginning when you get the yellow robe. And we're walking over the Vietnamese temple and he, we're halfway there, it's two blocks away. And he can, we're going along in our flip-flops. He turns to me and he says, by the way, you're giving a talk today. And I was startled. I was not used to speaking. I'm basically by nature shy, which always amazes people. And they argue with me when I say, they go, no, you're not shy. You talk all the time. We can't get you to shut up. But the reality is, if you took me to a party, I'd be the guy standing in the corner while everybody else was dancing. And I do not do this. Hello, my name is. I don't do that. And I've been to parties where, you know, this very outgoing person went around and made sure they introduced themselves to everybody at the party. I've gotten to parties I don't think I've ever introduced myself to anybody. 
I just stand over to the side. That's what I define as shy. So he tells me I'm going to give a talk. Now you have to understand, I'm going to a Vietnamese temple. Nobody speaks English. And I certainly don't speak Vietnamese. And yet he thinks I can give a talk. I'm like, ah, ah, ah. And I said, pseudo, which is what we called him. I said, pseudo, what am I going to talk about? He said, encourage them. Well, I've now spent 44 years or so encouraging people because that really stuck with me that he said, encourage them. I encourage people to be good. I encourage people to do meditation. I encourage people to try to keep the precepts. My life, really, if you look back on it, is a whole bunch of encouragement. And it was excellent advice. And I got up, and I have no idea what I said. I don't remember what I said. I don't think the earth shook or anything like that. I don't think anybody translated what I said. I think a lot of very nice Vietnamese people sat there and shook their head and had no idea what I was saying. But I encouraged them. I remember when I took the Bodhisattva vows. And I took them twice. I took them as a novice, and I took them as a fully ordained monk. The first time I took those vows as a novice, I had my scalp burned. That's a tradition in Vietnam and China for monks, that they will be branded as monks for the rest of their life. And so they put a, a sack full of incense on my head and lit it on fire. That was an experience. The only way I could share that experience with you is to set your head on fire. When I read the story about the master that told the monk to practice as if his head was on fire, I know exactly what he's talking about. The second time I did it was the 100-day memorial service for my master who had passed away. And the person that was running things said, those of you that want to can take Bodhisattva precepts in memory of your teacher. And so I got burned. Normally you get three marks across your head. And I got burned two more times. And so I had done that. Well, that first time that I got burned, there was a lady, Vietnamese lady, spoke no English. And there I was in my little gray robe, getting my head set on fire and chanting the whole time. Tianan told us, well, if you chant Om Mani Padme Hum, it'll help you not focus on the pain. Okay, we'll give that a try. And so there I was, sweat just running down, I remember. Just sweat flowing. And then it was over with. And there was a couple interesting things about this practice, which was primarily a Chinese practice. One of them was they wouldn't let you go to sleep that night. They had to sit up all night meditating. They were afraid that if you went to sleep, you'd never wake up because you got burnt. I don't know where that came from. Maybe some really old monk got burnt a thousand years ago and they did it. The other thing was they came out with little slices of watermelon. And they put the little piece of watermelon on the burn. And they said, this, this will keep it from getting infected. I had no idea where they came up with that idea, but I'll tell you what, it felt pretty good. They had this cold slice of watermelon. It wasn't a big slice, it was a little sitting on top of there. And as I'm standing there, really not knowing how to act, this little lady came up, she was about four foot two. And as I looked at her face, I I would guess that she was about 110 years old. A Vietnamese lady spoke no English and came up and bowed to me and tears were running down her face. And I realized this was the first time the 
that I truly encouraged the Vietnamese in their practice of Buddhism. Not to get their head burned, because the lay people did not do that. I encouraged them because they realized Buddhism was in America. The Vietnamese, when they arrived in America and went to Camp Pendleton, which was, oh, the receiving depot, the receiving station for the refugees, and from Camp Pendleton they would be sent out to different places in America. Uh, when they arrived, there was only one Vietnamese monk there. Everybody else were Americans. So I'm told by the monks that were there, I wasn't there. It was a great encouragement in 1975 to arrive in a foreign land. Imagine. I mean, we have, we have people that come from Guatemala, and they're leaving Guatemala because it's not a fun place to live. And they trek here, and they come here, and they know what they're going to get into. There's a reason why everybody comes to America, with the Italians and Greeks, Jews, the Mexicans and the Guatemalans, everybody else comes to America. It's the greatest country in the world. It's real straightforward. It's the land of opportunity. It's the only place for sure you can do whatever you want to do with your life. Waving my flag. The Vietnamese did not come here for that reason. The Vietnamese had participated in the Civil War. For those of you that don't understand what was going on in Vietnam, it was a Civil War. It was just like the Civil War here. It was the North and the South. And there were ideological differences. And the most obvious one was the North was communist, and the South was not. The South, centered around Saigon, was capitalist, and the South lost. And so they came here, one, because Vietnam was not going to be an unhappy place for them to live. It was going to be a pretty good place for them to die. Most of the soldiers that were caught by the Vietnamese from the north were killed right off. If they had any any garments left on them to indicate that they were a soldier. I watched a documentary on Vietnam, and the thing that sticks in my mind are the soldiers in the Army of the South walking quickly down the road, stripping off all of their clothes. So that at the end of the walk, they were in their under underwear. They did not want to have anything that labeled them as a soldier. And most of them that were caught, if they weren't shot, they were sent for seven years. That seems to be the amount of time they had to spend seven years in a re-education camp. And a very good friend of mine informed me one day, because he spent seven years in a relocation camp, that roughly half of the people died in those camps. So the people that arrived here they knew what they were escaping. They didn't arrive here thinking, well, I'm coming to the land of great opportunity. They were thinking, I'm arriving here and I'm escaping, at the bare minimum, a concentration camp or death. And certainly, I'm escaping prejudice against me. Well, things have settled down pretty much in Vietnam now. People go back and forth. They do it all the time. Nobody's angry at anybody anymore. But at that time, back in 1975, they needed encouragement. And they got it from the fact that here was one Vietnamese monk waiting for them, who had bought an old apart two-story apartment building and turned it into a temple so they could come there at least on the weekends and pray. And one of my monks commented to me, wait a minute, they're giving haircuts. 
because they always had a barber in the courtyard of the temple on Sunday giving haircuts to people that needed haircuts. And I said, yeah, it's the center of the community. Those are the things I know about. One of the things I know about, and I've started writing that book finally, because I thought, you know what I'm doing wrong here? And contrary to what I think about myself, I'm not that smart. I'm not writing a book about what I know. Because there's no point in writing a book about what I know that somebody else has already written 30 or 40 or 50 books about. So what I need to write about is my passion. I have a, a fellow that I follow on YouTube by the name of Thomas Sowell. He's an economist, a social historian. He's incredible. He's written like 44 books. And he only writes about what he knows. He doesn't write about his opinion. He tells you the way things were, historically, economically. And I've made a great discovery in the last few years, and people probably get tired of hearing me talk about it. But I'm going to write about it, because I feel very strongly about it. Americans don't know anything about Buddhism. They know all about Zen. You can go out and you can buy the books full of koans, stories about masters and disciples practicing together and the experience they had. And koans usually, when you get a book on them, they'll tell you what the enlightenment experience of the student was and how the teacher guided them to the enlightenment. And there is a feeling there is a notion in this country that Buddhism is about becoming enlightened. And Buddhism is not about becoming enlightened. And if I'm busting a bubble for you, well, there you have it. It's not about becoming enlightened. The Buddha didn't go off into the forest and spend seven years wandering around covered with ash and, and cow poop starving himself to death, giving up all desires that he had, and attempt to understand the world as it is. Wouldn't it be nice if we could understand the world as it is? Wouldn't it be nice if you could understand why somebody really dislikes you because of your political party? And I guarantee you, every one of you, there's a group of people that dislike you because of your political party. The last three elections we had were almost a 50-50 split. And we've been calling each other names for the last 10, 12 years, haven't we? Calling names. Them dirty, stinking rats, they just want to take what I've got. Or they don't care about people, or this or that. Wouldn't you like to be able to understand what's going on? I think everybody would. The Buddha wanted to understand why people seem to be pretty much unhappy most of the time. I always think of Harry Truman, one of the great presidents we had. The only president the left office broke. Completely broke. Didn't have a dime. Was in debt. Went into office in debt. Got out of office in debt. Took him years to pay off his debt. Everybody else, every president we have, of course, Mr. Trump went into office, a cabillionaire, so he doesn't count. But every other president we've had left pretty well off, making a lot of money. First thing they do is they offer the first lady, whoever she is, a million dollars to write a book about her experience. And that pushes them right over into that one percentile. The Buddha went off to try to understand why life seemed to be pretty crappy. Why are things as they are? Why don't people like each other? Why aren't people nice to each other? Why have we had, for the last 2,000 years, at any given moment, a war going on? 
answer that question, one of the most laughable things to me is to hear somebody say we're civilized, that we've got our act together, that we don't have anything left to learn, and yet we just go around killing each other on a regular basis. It's going on constantly. The Buddha wanted to know why. He could have cared less about enlightenment. Now let me tell you something. The notion of enlightenment had existed for 4,000 years in India. These religious people, these people that, and think about if you don't know, the practice in India, the way of looking at the world was, you had three parts of your life. You, you had a part where you studied, you had a part where you married and raised a family, and you had a part where you went off on a religious quest. Now, obviously, everybody doesn't do that, but it's, it's the three parts of life. So most of the time, if you go, we have a beautiful Hindu temple in Apple Valley. And as far as I know, everybody's welcome there. I'm shy, so I've never been there. My doctor told me, who was Indian, I was welcome anytime. And I said, go ahead, send me a car, invite me. I'm shy. I stand in the corner. I don't get out and dance. Mung is not shy. Mung will sit down at a bus stop, and within 15 minutes, he knows the life history of everybody that's there. So he goes over to the temple. He says, I'm going to check it out. I didn't know there was a monk there all the time, but there's a monk there all the time. So this whole idea of becoming awakened, the Buddha was predicted. The word Buddha means enlightened one. The Buddha was predicted by the Hindus that a great son of Krishna, a great son of Brahma, a great son of God would come along and become fully awakened. I'm not sure they knew what that meant, since they never had a Buddha, but they had this notion. The Buddha goes out, wanders around the forest, lives in caves, studies with different teachers, looks at philosophy, looks at these practices, learned how to meditate, finally gave up. He literally just gave up. He had looked at every possible explanation for why the world was as it is. And 2,600 years ago, it was no different than it is today. People hated each other, people fought wars. The only difference was, they, it was like Victorville fighting with Apple Valley. And then when they got done fighting with Apple Valley, they go fight with this area. Because that's what was going on in India, because there was all these little tiny, you know, kingdoms, city-states. And he gave up. He just was exhausted. He was pretty much ready to die. He sat down under a tree for shade and sat there and sat there and sat there and didn't eat. He had no desires at all. If you think killing your desires is going to give you the answer, it doesn't. He had no desires. He had no sexual desire. He had no, no desire to be around people, social desire. <coughs> he had no desire for comfort. These, these holy men in India they just slept on the ground. If the ground was full of, of rocks and stuff, they just slept right on it. They had to overcome, kind of like the Catholic mystics. We got to overcome the body because the body holds us back. And the Hindus had the same idea, probably before the Catholics. He abused himself. Physical comfort was not a need. Mental comfort was not a need. Sexual comfort was not a need. Food was not a need. He didn't need anything, and yet he did not understand why people couldn't be nice, why people couldn't take care of each other, why people couldn't encourage each other. A little girl came walking by, looked at him, his skin had turned black, he started to smell, and she said, the ascetic Gautama is dying. And he heard her. And he opened his eyes and he looked at this little girl, this beautiful little girl that was 10, 11 years old. 
and he said, huh, my entire life is a waste. I've done all of these things and they haven't brought me any closer to the answer. You know, I like to point out, people say, Buddhism is not a religion. There's a lot of people that learn that in college. Buddhism is not a religion. Buddhism is a philosophy of life. Except I took, I took philosophy in college and they never talked about the Buddha. Then I took comparative religions and by golly, they talked about the Buddha. But that was their opinion. It's, no, it's not really a religion. Why is it a religion? Well, because we don't pray to a god. Do we pray? Yeah, we do. Got to be honest with you. I know this is going to shake you up. We pray to the universe. We pray to each other. Be kind. Take care of people. That's what I say every time I give a talk to the Vietnamese now. I don't care what the talk's about. The last thing I say, Mom will tell you, the last thing I say is take care of each other. And don't just take care of each other, take care of your neighbor. Take care of anybody you come across that needs help. Because the Buddha basically sitting under that tree had disappeared. He had no personality. Everything was gone. You wouldn't want to be around him. He smelled so bad. And he decided that he had wasted his life, but he still wanted to understand what the hell was going on. Why were people like they were? Why was the world like it was? Why was everybody unhappy most of the time? So he decided, well, I need, I need to get on with it. So he got up, took a bath, cleaned himself up, went and got some rags out of the cemetery, tore out the, the soil pieces, made himself a little something to wear because he was naked by now. And the little girl brought him some rice pudding. I don't know whether there was any sugar or cinnamon because I make rice pudding when I make it. I put some milk in there and then I put a little sugar and I put a little cinnamon. But I don't think he had the cinnamon and the sugar. I think he just got the rice. And she gave him that rice and he sat there for seven weeks. And he got healthier and he got healthier and he got healthier. And at the end of those seven weeks, he looked up in the morning and he saw Venus, the morning star. If you go out in the morning just as dawn's starting to break, you can always see Venus. And he realized why everybody was unhappy. And it was so incredibly simple, so mundane, that when I read it as a 16-year-old teenager in a little book on comparative religions, I immediately converted to Buddhism. It was such a simple teaching. People are unhappy because they can't have things they want. People are unhappy because they are attached to things and don't want anything to change. I watch this show pretty regularly called This Old House. And in This Old House, I marvel at it because they, these people go in and they take a house that's probably worth a million dollars and they tear it all down and build it back up and now it's worth about five million dollars. And I always wait for them to talk about how much money it costs them to do this, and they never do. But when they get done, the house twice as big as it started, but the, the original house is gone. Change. We don't like change. We don't like to get old. We don't like to get sick. And doggone it, the average person doesn't like to die. The average person dies in terror. That's the reality of it. They don't want to let go. And the Buddha realized that's what's going on. People want things they can't have. People don't want things to change. It's that simple. And so he said, he used the word desire. 
we, later on we put attachment in there. It's another way of talking about desire. He said, people are unhappy because they desire things they can't have. But there, there's a solution to the problem of desiring things you can't have. You need to get that desire under control, and you can do it by the Eightfold Path. And that's what I'm going to write about.